Okay, so uh, uh, this is, uh, for me, it's an interesting topic because this is something that we come across uh, almost uh, every day in discussions with uh, customers uh, uh, looking to migrate to Postgres on a DBAS platform. And at the same time, um, uh, there's something that we also uh, kind of see these days with environments who are uh, struggling with performance issues or sometimes paying a um, lot of uh, uh, dollars and uh, incrementally their bills really going high and high every month and they approach and say like, okay, we have uh, deployed our databases on DBAS and we are now uh, landing into issues. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm just going to, uh, going, to uh, going to talk about myself. I'm uh, Avi. I'm also the co-founder and, uh, and the CEO of uh, MigOps. And I would always encourage uh, our team as well to contribute to open source. And uh, we have definitely contributed several uh, thousands of lines uh, in 2021 and 2022 to, uh, uh, to uh, open source extensions uh, around the Postgres ecosystem, especially enabling migrations to cloud, um, or migrations to Postgres on cloud, or migrations to Postgres. <laughs> so uh, before that, um, yeah, I also uh, got some experience on uh, multiple other databases, and I've written some books, and I still enjoy uh, writing um, articles on Postgres. OK. So, well, do I need a DBA for my databases on cloud? Um, maybe no, if there is one of these settings in place, right? Alta system set, start magic. I mean, if, if the uh, uh, databases on DBAS platforms are allowing us to configure this setting, which unfortunately they, they don't let us do, maybe uh, we do not need a, a DBA, right? Uh, so, yeah, but they don't enable this setting for us. So let's, let's look at the agenda for today, uh, right? So we're going to talk about DBAS, how it helps, uh, what does it not do for us today, some tuning that we need to be aware of, some of Postgres internals, scalability problems on DBAS maybe, and uh, at the same time, some interesting responses from cloud vendors. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'll look at uh, uh, a lot of other uh, aspects uh, around, uh, uh, you know, why we may be needing some expert, uh, you know, to sit in our environment and uh, start looking at our databases. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, because I, I've seen how it was several years ago or more than a decade ago, uh, ago as well. So if a developer needs to request a database for you know, his uh, development activities or even for testing something. I've seen uh, DBAs, or, uh, I'm see, uh, I've seen developers waiting almost uh, a month to even three months. And, and that's uh, in, in some of the environments. And I've also seen dev developers waiting for a week or more as well. However, DBAS has uh, definitely uh, uh, kind of uh, helped us um, uh, in this case, especially developers to uh, I mean, the concept of DBAS, where the provisioning can be more um, faster, this is great for developers, no doubt in this. And um, at the same time, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, especially for developers, uh, for development databases, maybe we could go ahead with minimal capacity planning, um, uh, but software installation, implementing security standards, database creation, implementing backup recovery, replication, all of that. If in case you know, a developer wants to really um, put some load and try to test in all the aspects and need a production-like environment as well, it is fairly not difficult to set it up today with uh, the capabilities of DBAS, no doubt in that. Uh, right? Um, uh, I mean, th that is what I was just uh, talking about. So it eliminates the need of uh, setting up physical hardware and um, um, definitely reduces the time that a developer needs to spend. So it could be e even some of the vendors are providing us some softwares using which we could uh, uh, you know, set up um, on-premise private cloud. However, how is uh, DBAS sold uh, by vendors today? Right? This, this term self-managed is a pretty tricky uh, word, which is heavily misunderstood when we are talking to customers these days. right? You know, we really don't need to do anything. Again, it, it goes back to the Alta system set, start magic to on command, right? 
uh, which uh, the vendors do not allow us to set, unfortunately. So, uh, so self-manage is a strongly uh, misunderstood term because um, uh, you know people feel, yeah, we don't need a, you know, we don't need an expert to start uh, looking at our um, uh, databases. I mean, cloud vendors really take care of everything. I mean, they say uh, our, uh, I mean, they say the DBAS. Uh, or whatever the database uh, uh, software that we get from it is three times or five times faster than Postgres. So I really don't need to do anything. They take care of uh, the uh, parameter tuning and uh, you know, also I can just migrate to self-managed DB, DBAS and that's it. They manage my software updates, upgrades, right? And uh, high availability. So yeah, I mean, we, we want to migrate to DBAS, but Trust me, everybody these days, or you know, since the beginning, right? Uh, like, um, wants uh, every customer to migrate to their platform, right? So there, there will be some kind of a vendor lock-in involved whenever you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, somebody selling you a service which is not open. So what DBAS does not do for us today, right? Or not do for us today? So let's start with uh, database tuning. The configuration parameter tuning offered on DBAS is very, very generic. So for example, um, I was looking at some of the environments where max connections is set to 16,000, 20,000. I mean, OK, uh, great. And um, so at the same time, um, that, why, why does uh, uh, those vendors do that? I mean, why is it, I mean, I wouldn't say tuned that way. Why is it set that way? Because ultimately, um, you know, vendors do not want you to start creating tickets stating that, you know, you're running out of connections and what to do, right? I mean, you know, you, you get into too many uh, errors uh, if you max out, out of the default uh, 100 connections and uh, they start getting so many tickets and, you know, they don't want you to do that, right? At the same time, tuning is based on the server capacity. This tuning does not understand your workload. I mean. DBAS does not have that learning in place. It cannot look at the patterns and automatically start tuning based on your workload. No, that, that's never possible. And uh, at the same time, there are several parameters in Postgres that needs to be tuned for the workload. Work mem, sort memory, lots of auto vacuum settings. And at the same time, I, I barely see anybody even uh, uh, you know, having the ability to understand, unfortunately, hot updates or what to do with an update intensive tables because they don't have any experts um, you know, who have the ability to understand it, unfortunately. Um, but it requires you to consult a DBA or someone who has a deeper understanding of Postgres architecture. So you need to have a Postgres DBA. Let me share one of the funny incidents. Um, we were on a very serious call. And um, uh, you know, while we were debugging an issue related to wraparound vacuums, uh, one of our agents was asking about, OK, uh, we see lots of uh, wraparound related uh, vacuums going on. So there are, um, by the way, are you aware of the advantages of version 14? Yeah, too many. I mean, any plans of upgrading it in the near future? Now nah, I'll use my iPhone 13 for another year, right? So OK, so you're using Postgres. I mean, what Postgres version are you using? Oh, yeah, let me look at it, right? Oh, we are on Postgres 12? I don't know that. Uh, I see it's supported until 2024. OK, great. So we are heavily relying on a service without trying to understand uh, what are the capabilities that, is going to, uh, that it is providing us and what, what are the extremes that we could go up to with the latest releases, because we don't know uh, what uh, an, uh, you know, a newer version does for us. I'll quickly go ahead with uh, some of the, um, I mean, very, very basic, like I have only five to six slides about MVCC and some of the things that um, maybe if someone needs to know. So how many of you uh, know about MVCC and uh, auto vacuum? Or how many of you do not know about it? OK. All right. So um, I mean, MVCC is some, uh, Postgres handles MVCC slightly different. MVCC stands for multi-version concurrency control. Con concurrency control. So, if I need to compare it with the way Oracle handles that today, right? So in Oracle, if you run an update or a delete, the past image, because it still needs to be available for read consistency, that is moved to a separate storage, which is called uh, undo, right? 
So this undo data resides in the table itself in Postgres, and that is managed through versions, right? Uh, transaction IDs, rather. Oh, yeah. So uh, each tuple has a heap tuple header data structure, and uh, that has got uh, the transaction IDs, x min, x max, so some of the things that most of us are aware, but I really don't want to go too deep into that. So due to this reason, uh, you need uh, some background workers which that are continuously doing some cleanup activities, especially auto vacuum launcher process that is uh, taking care of uh, spawning auto vacuum workers. At the same time, even we need to understand that we need to avoid uh, wrap around vacuums because that could be dangerous, right? Especially taking up a lot of resources, right? And there are a lot of things that we need to also make sure that we know. Similarly, when does auto vacuum run? There are certain parameters in place which are tracking, uh, you know, also some background workers in place. Again, I'm not talking about Postgres 14 because things changed in Postgres 14, but these background jobs or workers are, background workers are actually tracking the changes on a Postgres database and accordingly starting some maintenance workers in the back end. And this is something that happens all the time, right? So there are certain algorithms in the back end, like when an auto vacuum vacuum has to happen and when an auto vacuum analyze has to happen, right? So with those uh, 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 you know, default settings, for example, this is, I mean, cloud environments on the DBAS, maybe they go ahead and uh, tweak those vacuum scale factor or analyze scale factor to some other values, but again, they are continuously, they, they are still generic because whatever you tune, right? Regardless of the table size, if the condition for auto vacuum is reached, right? The table is eligible for auto vacuum. For example, you consider a table with, you know, uh, uh, 10 records and a million records. The frequency at which the table with 10 records get vacuum may be maybe much, really much more than a table with million records. I mean, this is something we see in general with default settings. So, you know, you see some tables going through millions of auto vacuums per day or thousands, whereas <coughs> some of the important tables do not even get vacuumed at least uh, once in a day, right? And uh, th these are some of the internals that, you know, not everybody understands, especially when they simply just go out and migrate to DBAS because they feel that they don't need to, or, or you may feel that you may, you may not need to know about it, right? So there are certain internals in Postgres that we must be aware of um, in order to uh, make sure that we, uh, you know, are really working on a highly scalable database. So talking about scalability again. So we also need to understand that DBAS is not scalable by default, but scalability does not mean that you enable auto scaling, right? So you, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I speak to some of the customers, um, they say like, yeah, we enabled auto scaling if required. It just adds another reader instance and our reads just get uh, spanned across more number of servers. But uh, that is not what scalability is, right? Your workload over a period of time demands maintenance. Are you sure that the same infrastructure can handle your workload and your database, you know, which has grown over, you know, certain period, of, I mean, certain amount of time, right? Because, you know, if, if, if we, um, uh, Ask, I mean, when we ask several customers about, um, uh, uh, you know, were you ever asked to upgrade your instance types because you had performance issues? Almost all the customers say that. Yeah, whenever we get a performance issue, our cloud vendor says, yeah, you need to increase your uh, instance capacity. Your instance type is not apt for your workload, right? I mean, they say that because they cannot have that visibility into your database workload, right? And you need someone who could do that for you. Similarly, um, um, if you don't uh, go ahead and perform a proper maintenance and just let the database run by itself because there is some magic being done by um, the vendors um, as an assumption, right? I mean, what really we see is increased bills because certain DBAS platforms also, um, you know, does not, of course, all, right? You need to pay for IOPS. 
you need to either add more storage or you need to either purchase more IOPS or you, know, or you need to choose certain environments that gives you unlimited IOPS, um, which has again got some limitations. So at the same time, DBAS does not take care of indexing, partitioning, you know, all of this for you. So you, at some point you need to understand, yeah, we did not realize such a workload is going to start on our database and um, now we need to start thinking about partitioning. Right, because I don't know how many of you are aware that an improper purging logic can really uh, increase your bills on DBAS. We're gonna talk about that. So, but again, well, I've tuned my application well. I handle indexing and partitioning really well. Do I really need a DBA who understands Postgres? There could be some resource-consuming background jobs. That, that, again, is because you haven't tuned your Postgres for your workload. And, you, and we, we are letting that happen, right? And, um, and for this, Postgres may get into a situation where it starts uh, you know, performing some aggressive um, uh, jobs, right? Again, version by version, there are definitely a lot of changes that have been done. Uh, to optimize, uh, 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 you know, these maintenance jobs. For example, Postgres 14, the way it treats, uh, you know, the, the, the way it uh, uh, takes care of wraparound vacuums is slightly different, right? Again, once such maintenance jobs are aggressively started by Postgres, it is important. It, it is it is slightly impossible uh, for us to get that into control. Now you can't directly go out and give it enough resources and there'll be lots of limitations. So we need to try avoiding that from happening by understanding our workload, right? And at the same time, you also need to understand that there is a transaction ID counter in Postgres, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. Of course, there are discussions in place about um, you know, having 64-bit transaction IDs, et cetera, right? So we need to talk about even trying to avoid a situation where Postgres starts running, you know, wraparound vacuums after a certain age is reached for a table. Of course, this t talk is not about transaction ID wraparound and auto vacuum internals, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, unless, unless somebody asks uh, uh, really uh, questions about it, I would not go much deeper into transaction ID wraparound. But, you know, I, I have seen almost 90% uh, of the customers who, reach, uh, who reached out to us um, you know, um, um, with issues have never cared about the age of database or monitoring the age of tables. And they say, we are continuously upgrading and adding more and more IOPS, but we still uh, see lots of challenges because you know, we don't know what's happening. Yeah. Most of the resources, I mean, it depends on the version that you are on at the same time, what type of maintenance jobs are being done uh, on the back end. But especially with age, I would say that not um, all the environments monitor the age of database or look at what are the tables that have got the uh, highest age and start monitoring the age or try to work on that, right? So again, I, I do not want to talk about the age or get into a complete um, detail about it unless uh, uh, somebody asks or um, uh, want, to, want, to, want me to explain that better. But um, yeah, so we just need to realize that there is the setting called auto vacuum freeze max age, which forces Postgres to start aggressive vacuums uh, once age of 200 million is reached, right? And uh, what that does and what is the impact created by that Honestly speaking, I, I have not seen uh, much of the uh, 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 you know, customers knowing that, right? Because of uh, lack of a database administrator or an expert who could help with that. So Postgres uh, does, uh, uh, you know, like, um, uh, I mean, it, it would not allow you to get into the situation of a real wraparound, so it starts giving you some warnings and uh, ultimately it says, sorry, we cannot let you um, uh, write or, uh, to the Postgres database until you um, uh, open the database in a single user mo uh, mode. I'm not sure if somebody has tried to uh, 
reach that age on a DBAS, uh, 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 you know, Postgres on DBAS, right? But the thing is, you will not be able to open your Postgres in a single user mode. You will not have access um, or a file system level access or even your support vendor uh, would not be able to, uh, you know, go ahead and open Postgres uh, in a single user mode if that happens. You just need to wait until it uh, finishes the cleanup. So again, unable to right size your databases. For example, um, uh, you know, one of the customers was um, asking, like, okay, uh, can you help me understand why query is performing slow, right? I have your support dear cloud vendor, right? Uh, and then the support representative says, sorry, we are not authorized to access your databases, but I see a lot of I.O. and CPU activity. So we may provide you some query IDs based on the uh, monitoring that we see, right, which are waiting for I.O., or the simplest one is to go ahead and upgrade your instance capacity, right? And um, yeah, so I need to resolve this issue immediately, so let me just uh, go ahead and upgrade my instance capacity. And now once I upgraded it, I'm afraid that, you know, if I downgrade or downsize, um, uh, you know, again, what if the same issue happens again, right? And if the same happens, I know last time I upgraded, so let me go to the bigger instance, and I have really seen environments that upgraded to the most uh, highest instance types, after which they don't have anything else. I mean, maybe uh, you know they could attempt to upgrade, but unfortunately, um, uh, you know the reason for that is a deeper understanding of the workload, right? And uh, sometimes lack of connection poolers uh, or improper vacuuming strategy or improper usage of indexes. Maybe you don't, uh, you're not uh, looking at your update intensive tables and trying to um, uh, you know, um, make the benefit of uh, hot updates. And one more thing that we need to understand is with growing data and uh, improper partitioning or no partitioning, when you want to purge data for the last, let's say, some amount of time, you run a delete statement. And that itself is taking some, I mean, um, uh, you know, you, you, using some IOPS, and you're also paying for running a single delete statement sometimes, right? Because it is, it is definitely reading some data, starting to delete and shipping that, replicating that, you know? So there's a lot of um, IOPS involved. So this is why you need a DBA or an expert who can understand, um, um, uh, you know, your workload or the database's workload and then start um, uh, right-sizing it um, with proper um, estimation of what type of maintenance or what type of uh, um, um, uh, you know, tuning needs to be implemented in your environment. Also, sometimes you may be paying for the innovation by your cloud vendor in an attempt to sell you a faster fork of Postgres. It's an attempt to sell you a, a faster uh, fork of Postgres. So this is where, uh, I mean, I. Uh, I would say like it's important for us to benchmark and um, see, um, you know, why is it um, uh, said that way? Is it is it really applicable for our workload? Because this is again very generic. Um, because we have really seen the statement failing for a lot of workloads, right? And that is because of lack of. Um, um, uh, people with expertise looking into the design and the metrics, right? And sometimes you may forget to benchmark because a lot of production test suites may show great results when, it, when the tests are run for an hour or two, right? Uh, I, I mean, when you run it for an hour or two, yeah, maybe you're not letting all the background workers or vacuums or wraparound vacuums happen, so that's great, and you just conclude that Everything is great, your changes are great, right? But a true performance test is when benchmarks are run for a longer duration. Your, your test suite needs to run for a longer duration and you must be able to try it failed. It's important for us to understand when it dips or when it breaks, right? When the performance really dips over a period of time. And that is when you, your DBA or an expert really has to um, um, uh, tell you 
what is the maximum capacity uh, up to which uh, our Postgres database can scale up to, right? And uh, how should we distribute it later? We have lots of um, advanced uh, features in Postgres and several extensions that help us distribute. I mean, we also have native sharding with Postgres with advanced capabilities of Postgres, FDW, and partitioning in place, right? So um, um, I think we need to understand you know, how we can uh, go ahead and uh, innovate with the existing features of Postgres and see how we can uh, make Postgres run better and longer. Sometimes database upgrades are not really seamless. I mean, this is one more thing that, is, that may be sold as well, right? I mean, I was talking to, uh, again, one of the customers, and they say, yeah, we don't need to manage our database upgrades. Uh, our vendors do that for us, right? But, okay, yeah, there may be clickable options to go ahead or maybe some kind of CLIs or, uh, you know, to help you perform the upgrades. But um, sometimes when you need to um, deal with your complex database and also try to limit the downtime involved during upgrades, yeah, you need to leverage some other smart approaches. Maybe logical replication is one among them, right? However, when you start trying to uh, leverage logical replication and um, let it replicate from the primary, um, again, that can start impacting the full load as well. So how can you smartly achieve the upgrade in a way that you can try to minimize the amount of downtime and also minimize the impact on a production database, right? For this reason, I mean, I've also seen several environments uh, that are giving uh, opportunities to, or services to um, replicate, um, uh, you know, Postgres from a lower version to a higher version, and also recommending to have multiple rep replication slots, like logical replication slots created, maybe parallel subscribers, et cetera. But there are also disadvantages when you have, uh, uh, you know, high wall generation and also uh, each subscriber reading the same wall segment and decoding it, you're, you're really putting a larger load on the system. So it's important for us to then come up with a strategy and an approach to start upgrading. So again, this requires someone to really sit on it instead of we getting into an issue once we start clicking the upgrade button because test environments really do a great job. <laughs> and Something that um, is interesting again is my Postgres is slow, or my Postgres database is slow after migration, right? And Oracle was better. This is either because you did not tune your Postgres correctly, or great, you found an opportunity of improvement. So let's reach out to the community, right? And let's, let's talk about that, because mm, com community or when you, when you start sending emails, nobody says like, oh, how can you say that Postgres is slow? Come on, don't, don't even send an email. I mean, I don't think we have ever seen such a uh, response, right? So again, it's important for us to speak to experts and validate. Again, review of schema changes. Sometimes schema changes can cause outages if DBAs or experts are not reviewing them, right? And uh, while I was talking to, again, while we were talking to one of the customers, they said, we performed a change on a database, but it started terminating connections on a standby. We have not declared that there would be an outage for our customers who are only doing retransactions against a standby. Okay, right? So these are some of the behaviors that we may not see on our test environments, but you know, we need to understand that there are some parameters in place that can try to pause or try to uh, help us uh, move with such changes without impacting customers. So maybe we need to think about a different approach to avoid that. So it's again a DBA or a Postgres DBA who would be aware what a change could do um, on or, or how a change could impact a database. Okay, so on a high level, we need DBAs for parameter tuning, capacity planning, upgrades, schema changes, recommendations on design changes, performance tuning, and, and the list is endless. There are a lot of things that uh, you know, the um, uh, DBAS vendors cannot help us with, unfortunately, right? Again, this is not yet a word of that 
right? <coughs> Excuse me. Again, worried about too many folks? Trust Postgres and we have a long way to go. And um, again, Miga, I work for MigOps, um, and uh, I, I just uh, have some promotional side, a, a slide uh, about uh, MigOps, but thank you, and I'm open for some questions. Uh, I'm done with my slides. So. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I, I doubt questions though, but <laughs> it's not a technical talk. But yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, maybe we can chat more about this afterwards, but I'm curious about like in the cases where uh, the support teams do have visibility, like for example, you can work with the team to uh, like understand you know, what kind of queries are running and stuff like that. How true do you think some of these things are? Uh, I, I, I definitely think like you hit on a lot of good points about how you know, fully managed isn't fully managed, which I think uh, you know, in, in a lot of my conversations with people on various databases or services, it's, it's uh, definitely true. But I'm curious about like, when you're working with support teams that are more hands-on you know, how much of, because uh, we get this question a lot at timescale, which is like, you know, we're using a fully managed service, do we still need, like how much of DBA support do we need? And mostly we get like, do you recommend, have people that you can recommend? And I can probably recommend MigOps. But I'm just curious about like, how do you see that spectrum? Because uh, like not all support teams just like, you know, uh, can see like a black box. Yeah, I think, I think uh, um, um, if, if there are such provisions where support can actually has access, can access the uh, databases um, on which there are, um, you know, let's say customers reported some issues and they say, yeah, we have this issue, so you can now access the database, can you tell us what to do? That's, that's great, so maybe you could go ahead and uh, uh, talk about the best practices at that point of time, help them implement, which is great, but, um, Again, talking about um, uh, the limitations in that aspect as well, right? So you are going to talk about that specific issue, but uh, again, if it's, if it's also involving some kind of, okay, let me also read your workload, let me uh, you know, try to help you right size your instance, let me help you do almost all the activities that we discussed, right? I think that would be wonderful, because that is what we see as uh, currently something as, um, uh, where we see too many customers paying or spending really more and more dollars because of um, not doing some of these things right, right? But um, yeah, it's, it's actually great if uh, timescale uh, uh, support is uh, trying to help customers by even accessing the database and uh, help, you know, kind of, uh, it's, it's a reactive approach though, right? Uh, but um, I think I would say with Maybe uh, uh, you know an in-house DBA or a DBA, right? Uh, we should be able to make it more proactive or predictive. Last call. Anyone else for a question? Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>